everybody's so polite. They just all of a sudden hushed, which is, you don't get that at work, that's for sure. Okay. Um, we are right at 7 o'clock, so for folks that know me, they know that I like to run a pretty tight ship. So I uh, just wanted to welcome everybody to our second annual information session. My name is Leah Pierce. For those that who don't know me, I'm the chairperson of the Compassionate Committee for the Homeless in North Bay. And uh, thank you for braving the weather and the roads. Um, this is a, a great turnout. Uh, we are being recorded for YouTube because Trinity United has a YouTube channel. And I want to thank um, everybody at Trinity United for hosting us. They've been absolutely wonderful in supporting us yet again. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to, um, I know that my committee is going to hate that I'm going to do this, but I'm going to just uh, want the committee members from the Compassionate Committee to stand, if you could, and just sort of wave and just say, these are the folks. Sue is down at the door, but I just wanted to <laughs> shout out. So we are missing a few. Uh, but uh, for various reasons, but I just wanted uh, to shout out to the hardworking folks on the Compassionate Committee. And um, we do have uh, guest speakers with us tonight. Uh, thank you for braving the elements. And I uh, just wanted to say that uh, we have Tanya Healy and Brian Ede who will be talking about the anti-stigma campaign presentation. John McKenzie and Josh from True Self, and Steve Ellis, and I say expert by experience, and uh, he has quite a powerful story to share with us this evening. And um, so we uh, just wanted to let everybody know that we do have uh, Eric Tashner from CTV Northern Ontario here, um, and we also have mics in the audience so that when it does come to the question and answer period, if you could go up to the mics so that on YouTube we can hear your questions, that would be appreciated. Now, um, we are going to invite Nancy to come up uh, to give the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg peoples and within the lands protected by the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850 used by the members of Nipissing First Nation. We also acknowledge the nearby Anishinaabeg communities of Dokies First Nation and Tomogamy First Nation. We thank them for sharing this land with us. It is our hope that this land acknowledgement also serves to send a broader message to everyone that we are committed to the hard work of building a more inclusive, respectful, and equitable community, and we welcome the relationships we will build on our journey to a better tomorrow. Thank you. Sorry, can you hear me? Thank you, Nancy. Uh, now I'd like to call upon Anne, and she is going to uh, bring us to center and lead us in prayer. Let us take a moment to calm our souls and acknowledge the presence of God in our midst. Let us pray. Creator God, we gather in this place to learn, to share experiences, and to deepen our compassion. Our hearts and minds are with those who are experiencing homelessness. May they know a measure of your peace and hope in the midst of their struggles. We gather as people who care, as organizations who care. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are among us. Come close to us, that we may come close to you. Open our hearts and our minds to the words that are spoken, as well as to each other. Lead us in our search to be your hands and feet of divine love in our community. 
We pray all this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Anne. Okay. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce our first uh, presenters. We have Tanya Healy, who is the Community Health Promoter, Healthy Living Program with the North Bay Perry Sound District Health Unit, and Brian Ede, expert by experience, who is highlighted in See the Person program. And uh, they just came back not too long ago from uh, presenting at the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness Convention in Halifax. So I'd like to encourage you to come take the stage. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Nancy and Anne, for that warm opening. John, I'm just looking for I'm just looking for the key message. Is that um, initial image able to be displayed? That's it. Thank you very much. So as mentioned, I'm Tanya Healy. I am a community health promoter with the North Bay Perry Sound District Health Unit. I have been working alongside Brian on a, an anti-stigma campaign related to homelessness, which is called See the Person. And hi, everybody. My name is Brian Aid. Um, I am a, um, I'm at, currently at the Warming Center, um, but have been working with Gathering Place for the past couple of years, I guess. Um, and yeah, this, like Tanya said, since 2020, we've been putting this uh, program together and doing different presentations, and it's been it's been very um, successful, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, we started this campaign. Just a, a little bit of background. We started this campaign in 2020. So we saw an increased visibility of homelessness in our community of North Bay, but also the broader district of Nipissing. And it was really in response to that and an increasing visibility of stigma. So negative attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that are held toward, uh, held about a group um, due to their uh, current life situation. So um, the conversation in our community seemed to be heavily influenced by media and shaped by media, and then also taken us sort of down a dark path into the negative comments on social media. And our group of community organizations felt we had something to say about um, the homelessness situation in our community. And so that's where we came up with this key message of see the person, be kind, and recognize that everyone has a story. So we will dive into, we have two videos that, um, short, very short videos, one minute each, that uh, bring, um, center the voices of people with lived experience with homelessness. Um, Brian is featured in the campaign. Um, as well, so a generous sharing um, from those individuals. So we're gonna go ahead and play the first video. Race, gender, education, all those things have an impact on how people become homeless. Just be kind and see the person. The negative comments do nothing but hurt and perpetuate and keep the stigma going. Everybody has a story. I came from an, a very abusive home. I came from foster care. And then I was homeless, not getting the basic necessities of life. And then having people abusing me on a regular basis. And that's what happens. I was running a successful business. Had a, a, a few things that came into play that shut it all down really unexpectedly. And next thing you know, I was without a home. Try to keep in mind, you know, that you're seeing somebody at probably the worst point in their life. It's a human being. Thank you very much for, for 
for sh um, sharing that, John. So I, um, I started this, um, this line of work uh, about 10 years ago or so. Um, I'm from this town. Um, I know a lot of the community. They're very kind, loving folks. Uh, we have that kind of small town mentality that everybody's willing to help each other out. But doing this work, I noticed that there is a lot of uh, misconceptions, a lot of negativity, a lot of stigma directed at the folks that we work with. And every, every single situation, every time I had the opportunity to talk about these things, um, this program has actually given me some statistics to help kind of counterbalance some of the things that we hear so often. Some of the get a jobs or how there's stigma attached to um, each individual. There are assumptions being made of what they do or how they live their life. And I challenge everybody at any point, like have a conversation with one, with one story and it'll change your views on everything. So part of this, um, some of the statistics that we, um, that we presented in this is uh, like Jen's story is one in four reported um, experience in foster care or group home. Um, nearly half experienced homelessness before the age of 25. 64% um, of folks say that they have mental health challenges. 69% say that they struggle with substance use. And 39% of those are learning disabilities. So a lot of these things aren't really in, in a lot of someone's control, so to be judged and stigmatized the way they are. That's why this program, you know, is important to us. I, I think so often, too, and Brian, you would um, likely see this uh, on, on the daily, unfortunately. Um, when it comes to stigma, like, blame is placed on individuals for their circumstances. So, uh, people perceive that there is a character flaw or a personality characteristic that is placing this person um, in this situation, that they've made a choice to be there. With this campaign, we like to highlight the structural factors, so the systemic issues at play, that can sometimes be part of folks' stories. So. Big pieces that we like to highlight are adverse childhood experiences. So those are experiences with trauma before the age of 18. There is a very high correlation between adverse childhood experiences and homelessness. Brian shared the statistic about individuals first experiencing homelessness before the age of 25 as being quite high. So that is these are the types of things we need to be considering. What has led this person to, to um, uh, be in the position that they, they are in today? We also talk about poverty as a key driver of homelessness, impacts of colonization, um, and violence, including community violence, a lack of affordable housing. So these are all factors that are well outside of an individual's control. Um, so we go so far as to say that um, homelessness is not a personal choice, that it's a policy choice. If we wanted to see changes related to housing and, um, and addressing homelessness, that we really, we could through healthy public policy. We have one more video to share before we wrap up. I haven't had any extreme periods of being on the street, but I have been homeless on numerous occasions. Those of us with lived experience, obviously, you know, have seen both sides, uh, whether it be mental health, uh, you know, problematic drug use, or both. There's been a growth in, you know, people with struggles in their lives more and more becoming homeless. You walk around with this ingrained feeling of shame, right? Like, all those little moments add up to a little bit of hope, right, when people treat you with dignity because you don't feel like you deserve any. The bottom line is that as a person, they had hopes and dreams like everyone else. And somewhere along the way, that got sidetracked and not always by their own fault, right? What's home mean to me now? Like, it's been so long since I actually had one. Now that I have one, I feel safe. I feel like I get to uh, grow as a human. A 
it's a fairly emotional video, um, and I invite you, if you feel um, moved by that video or upset in any way, um, we're certainly here to, to chat with you after the presentation. Um, I think Sean's words, the gentleman in the ball cap, about uh, um, individuals, when people treat you with dignity you feel because you feel like you don't deserve any, those little moments add up to a bit of hope. Um, so, as much as we understand that there are big structural changes that are needed, the everyday acts of kindness can't go underestimated. So, it, with our campaign, we encourage you take, to take action in three ways. So, one is around compassion. So, using, a, using person first language. So, language like person experiencing homelessness as opposed to homeless person. We encourage those everyday acts of kindness. Um, we encourage education. So learn about populations that um, experience, experience homelessness. Seek out information from local community services. Seek out information about trauma and violence-informed care or a trauma-informed approach. And the third piece is around advocacy. So we encourage you to vote. We encourage you to talk to your elected officials at every level of government about what you see in your community. We don't need to be experts on the topic to point out what we're um, seeing our neighbors experiencing. And please visit our website where you can find a lot more information, including those videos. Well, thank you so much, Tanya and Brian, for sharing the information as well as the stats, because I think a lot of people have come here with open minds to understand more about, um, you know, the homeless. So uh, at this time, I'd like to open up the floor to any questions. We do have microphones located here and here in the aisles. So if you could come up with your questions, that way we can hear them a lot clearer. As well, they'll be on YouTube. So does anybody have any questions? So quiet. So you were very thorough. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <All right. laughs> I was going to say, you're so thorough that there's no questions. Hello. Um, I was wondering, OW and ODSP, the payments that the people receive, if they're able to receive them somehow, they're often like still leaving people below the poverty line. Like, so I was wondering if. The question would be for both of you. If universal basic income, maybe for certain populations, would be something that might be helpful. Yeah, that's a, com that's a topic of conversation at any seminar, conference. It's always something that everybody's pushing for. And I mean, yeah. It's certainly a uh, policy that our local public health unit, a number of uh, public health units across Ontario, uh, promote a uh, basic income guarantee. Um, I read, actually, at the uh, conference, the Canadian Alliance to End, conference, uh, End Homelessness Conference, there was an, a great statistic here that was shared by Abacus Data, a, com a company that does polling in Canada. They shared that 64% of households with children under 18 report living paycheck to paycheck. So it's not only um, individuals, ex um, of course, poverty among individuals receiving social assistance is a major issue. Um, but I think also uh, worth recognizing is that uh, we're seeing a great, a growing number of um, employed individuals who are, um, could be a paycheck away from uh, a housing crisis. But thank you very much for the question. Any other questions? I have one, so, but I wanted to wait until anybody, okay. So when you went to Halifax and you made your presentation, 
Um, did anybody approach you that, you know, to, to ask how they could sort of create their own anti-stigma campaign program in their community? That was kind of our presentation. So that was the, the group that we were representing was how to okay. do this in your own community. So we did have a lot of questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah we had folks, um, the moderator was, the moderator of our panel session was from the Northwest Territories and also a board member of Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness. And, and she said, well, she just fully endorsed our campaign right after our presentation. Couldn't have been better. And uh, she said, oh, we're fully play planning to plagiarize this um, uh, in the Northwest Territories. Uh, we had folks from Cambridge reach out to us. Today we presented to um, a systems change collective through the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness, which is systems change makers that come together um, to share information there and there was a lot of interest so we are like hey we put a little bit of work in let's share it with other communities and there seems to be some interest okay well thank you so much thank you both for coming and just watch this step when you're <laughs> heading down um, thanks again um, it's always wonderful to uh, to have you here um, Brian of course uh, he came out to one of our meetings um, as our guest uh, when we had a nice dinner. So, and Tanya, it's lovely because um, you did a presentation with us when we were first starting out back in 2021. So thank you so much again. Well, thank you for having us. <laughs> okay. Okay, and our next presenters are from True Self. We have John McKenzie, and he is an outreach services supervisor, uh, and he's accompanied by Josh, and they're going to talk about, um, let me see here, uh, peer initiatives and peer support, and harm reduction as well. So um, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thanks. And a great presentation, Brian. Tanya. I was going to say Talia. I'm so bad with names. I see so many names. <laughs> I actually had the pleasure of seeing that presentation twice now once at the Learn Conference. And uh, yeah, it's, it's awesome with the anti stigma. And we touched a little bit on stigma in this as well because that is definitely a huge piece of harm reduction. Um, oh, is that better? There, now I can hear myself. Yeah. Um, no, I was just saying with the anti-stigma campaign about how that's a huge piece of harm reduction which is needed in the community to be able to find a solution um, instead of just keeping on, uh, dwelling on dwelling on the problem and the negatives that a lot of people tend to do. Um, so yeah, my name is John McKenzie. I'm the supervisor of Outreach Services at True Self Deb Windeswin. Um, I've worked there since uh, 2021. When I first started, I was a peer bridger working mostly with people on probation. Uh, but we had a really small outreach team at the time of just two people, so I was doing quite a bit of outreach as well. Um, and I will introduce, uh, well, Josh will introduce himself. Ani Boju, Josh Nadishnikas, Tomogmi First Nation, Nojiba, Shamshakwe, and Dodem. So, as uh, John just introduced me, my name is Josh Fulbert. I'm an Anishinaabe man from Tomogmi First Nation. I'm an outreach peer support worker for True Self. I'm also a fourth year bachelor's social work student at Nipsing University. And uh, also, I have also lived experience with homelessness as well. So we're just doing everything we possibly can, you know, to raise awareness and to combat stigma and just to, you know, pass this message along that, you know, everybody does have a, a story and everybody's valuable. Um, so, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our services at True Self, but to start off, uh, Josh, oh, to start off here, Josh has uh, done up a great definition on what peer support means to us, because at True Self we are a peer-led organization, uh, so all of our staff have lived experience in some form of, or another, either with homelessness, addictions, incarceration, uh, mental health, um, and then he's also got a great definition of what harm reduction means to us, because it means different things to a lot of different people. So, Josh? Thank you. So I'll start out by just uh, giving a little bit of a description of uh, what True Self does. So True Self Debbie Wendeswin serves our community members regardless of their background 
and we address gaps in services that have allowed the most vulnerable members of our population to suffer undue harm, isolation, and deprivation. By applying a holistic approach, incorporating Indigenous healing knowledge and practices, True Self Debbie Wendeswin empowers the underserved populations in Nipissing District to achieve greater mental wellness, life stability, and economic autonomy, while building stronger and more positive connections to our community. One of those ways that we do that is through peer support. Um, it's, uh, it's one of our go-tos at, at True Self, and uh, we just think it's amazing, right? So at the core of peer support is a supportive relationship that usually occurs between two people, right? Uh, these two people, they meet as equals, and they share similar life experiences. So peer support is non-clinical, it's non-judgmental, and it's also powerful. Peer support is flexible because it can occur in many different settings, on a walk, in the bush, in a coffee shop, or on an online call. It can inspire hope and promote healing and growth in a community context. But most importantly, sharing similar experiences can help a person realize that they're no longer alone, and when you reduce that isolation, you promote resilience. So I'm just gonna touch quickly on, uh, on harm reduction. So harm reduction is an evidence-based, uh, person-centered approach to reducing negative consequences of actions and behaviors, right? So when most people hear the term harm reduction, they may automatically think of substance use, clean syringes, condoms, and safe consumption site. It is that, right? But it's a lot more than that as well. Harm reduction can take place on many forms. For instance, education can be a form of harm reduction. Learning about issues such as mental health or living well unhoused can reduce stigma, can reduce stigma, therefore reducing the potential for harm. Another example of harm reduction is providing unhoused folks with warm clothes and sleeping bags in the winter, providing hungry people with food or dry Susans and socks in the spring when it's wet to prevent trench foot. Harm reduction saves lives by being available and accessible. It doesn't close at 4.30 p.m. and it's open on weekends. Thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, so when I started in 2021 at True Self, again, there was only two uh, of us outreach workers, and it uh, seemed like two of us could get it done at the time, and since then, our outreach department, we have seven outreach workers now, which sounds great, more jobs, but when you're getting more outreach workers, it's probably because there's a problem growing in your city, and that's definitely what we've seen over the past few years, and it's uh, getting worse. It hasn't even gotten to the point where it's kind of leveled off before it gets better. It's definitely going to continue to get worse before it gets better. And um, so some of the services that we provide in our outreach um, is we do encampment outreaches twice per week. Um, and when I say encampment outreach, this is going out, we actually have to drive to them now. Um, whereas before in 2021, uh, I was able to actually walk to most of the encampments. Like there was the one on 3rd Street, they were all close to downtown. Um, but since then, because bylaw, they get pushed out and further away. They're all on the outskirts of town, whether they're up by Duchesne, way up by the college. Um, so we have to drive to them now. So we go out to these encampments twice per week, and we uh, provide food security. Uh, we'll hand out PPE, such as uh, so PPE, personal protective equipment, um, which can be anything from naloxone, uh, fentanyl testing strips, which we have where people can test their drugs, either directly via their drug or through urine analysis. Um, sleeping bags to keep them warm. Uh, again, with the food security, we, we do that in partnership with the gathering place. They have a food security there, so we can go and we can actually pick up pre-made bags of food where we can bring to these encampments to drop off to individuals. Um, we can bring them out garbage bags, because a lot of times that's uh, what the community doesn't like to see, is the mess. And even though sometimes it's not even their mess, that's people see the mess, a call gets called into bylaw, person gets a 24-hour eviction notice, they got 24 hours to pack up all their belongings, which is their entire lives, and get out of there. So sometimes if it's just bringing out garbage bags so they can keep the mess contained, that uh, helps them stay in their place for a little longer. Um, another thing we let them do, or uh, we assist with, is we can provide our phones to make phone calls. So if these individuals have maybe missed a bail check-in, 
uh, we can actually call with them so they can make sure they get to a bail check-in before they get a breach, um, which would then mean that they were probably going to be incarcerated again, which helps break that cycle of them being re incarcerated simply because they missed their appointment because they didn't have a phone. And let's be honest, like if I didn't have a calendar on my work email, I'd be missing half of my appointments too. It's pretty hard to keep track even with all the technology and we have to remember most of these individuals don't have cell phones or any appointment reminders. So uh, we do go out, we'll give them appointment reminders, let them use our phone if they have to make appointments. Um, also, uh, we also provide smudging and uh, sharing circles. So at some of these encampments, if there's multiple people and they want to have a sharing circle, uh, our staff will do a smudge and a talking circle with them right on site, because um, we know it's hard sometimes to come into our office where we have our talking circles, depending on the distance of where they are. So they can come, or we go right to them with the smudging and talking circles. Um, so again, that's the encampment outreach that happens twice per week. We also have a downtown uh, street outreach that we do daily. And that's kind of more of just a walk around the downtown core where, we'll, where we can connect with the vulnerable population. Um, again, we hand out the PPE, such as the naloxone, the testing strips. Uh, there's times where our staff have had to, multiple times, administer naloxone to people that are uh, overdosing. Uh, so our staff are all trained to be able to provide that service as well. And uh, in the summer, we so in the winter, it's kind of more towards the downtown core, Oak Street to McIntyre, Castles to Fisher. But in the summer, we will go as far as uh, the Mother House. We'll take the trails, like we'll go down to uh, Memorial Drive, and our team will actually walk the trails because people like to hang out in the bushes there and stuff. So uh, a lot more walking in the summer, and um, our catchment area is a little bigger when it comes to the street outreach in the summer. Uh, but we are out there every day, uh, minus 30, rain or shine. Our team goes at least minimum one time per day to do the street outreach. And uh, it's a new pilot that we've recently started doing uh, in collaboration with a security team uh, through the city where we send out one of our peer outreach workers and a security guard. Uh, it's called the Peer Outreach Security Team, or POST for short. That started in July, and that's an evening outreach where we, again, it's concentrated in the downtown core. And uh, we go out and try and uh, provide services, whether it's referrals or, again, handing out the PPE to individuals in need um, during the evening. Um, we also, uh, during that post outreach, we connect with businesses where we actually go into businesses and uh, provide business cards or if they need any support. Because we found that's a big piece to reducing the stigma, right? It starts with the businesses downtown instead of calling the cops every time, you know, someone might be having yelling or shouting out front because the they could just be having a bad day, or, you know, maybe somebody stole something from them. So instead of calling the cops all the time, if it's a simple de-escalation, they can attempt to call us first and then we can try to de-escalate, which most of the time, because we built that rapport during the street outreach and we use that peer approach, um, more times than not, we are able to defuse the situation before the police are called. Um, we also hand out a lot of uh, clothing when we go out, that's donation based. So uh, like the locks so on the testing strips, um, that comes through part of our funding. Um, but we also hand out, like sometimes we'll get donated hygiene kits. I know the Compassionate Care Committee, we got some backpacks from you guys, which were amazing. Those were put to very good use this summer. Um, but yeah, so a lot of socks, like uh, Josh was saying with his uh, harm reduction, socks is a big one because in, the winter, it's the frostbite, and then the summer, it's the, fr uh, the trench foot, um, which is pretty nasty if you've ever seen it. It's, it's not a very nice sight to see, and the thing with trench foot is like when your feet are wet and you got no socks or dry shoes or anywhere to dry them, it just gets worse and worse, and a lot of these folks, they won't go to the hospital because of bad experiences. Um, I've had, per um, when I was living with addiction in the past, I had a really bad experience at the hospital, so I know it's not just a rumor when uh, the vulnerable population is saying, uh, that they don't get treated very well there because I personally experienced it myself. Um, and, you know, most of these folks, they don't have family doctors and the wait lists. Well, we all know how the wait lists are to get a family physician. So most of the time it's a referral over to uh, the walk-in uh, clinic to see the nurses at the AIDS committee Tuesdays and Thursdays. And again, they can go in there and maybe get some wounds treated, but then the rest of the days they're out and about and it's really hard for them to take care of their wounds, especially when their feet are wet. But... Um, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it in a nutshell when it comes to our outreach. Um, 
information. Yeah, I tried to keep it short. I had some uh, chicken scratch down here. I was like, how am I going to stretch this 10 minutes? I'll figure it, it, a way. It works. And I got it, it works. Done. Yeah. Well, you did it. Yeah. You filled the 10 minutes, so that's oh, awesome. Awesome. Um, so now I'm going to open the floor up to questions. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Josh or John? And if you do, I encourage you to go to the mics. The mics don't bite, so I encourage you. There we go. How do we get a hold of you if there's an opportunity to de where some we can see somebody needs de-escalation or supports rather than calling the police? We have. You don't have a card on you, do you? Steve, you got a card on you, Steve? Yeah, Steve's got us covered. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Good job, Steve. Two, Steve. She needs a second. I think we get another one here. I was just thinking that it would be a good idea if we all had an opportunity for that number to call. Because uh, we we do encounter at different times, and if we can, uh, you know, get you involved, it would be a good thing. closer to the yeah, just closer to the mic, oh, please. Sorry. Yeah, I was just saying, I think it would be a good idea for us all to have that access to that number, so simply because I think we all have a chance, uh, you know, have encountered, and if it if it's a chance for de-escalation or whatever, it would be a good one to have. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so the thing with that outreach, though, um, the boundaries that we have is uh, we don't go any further than Castles, uh, Fisher, Worthington, and Oak Street. That's part of the, again, that's not our decision, but it's our, up to us. We, we're hoping to expand it in the future, but again, it is a pilot that the city's put on. Uh, so as long as it's in that catchment area, and during right now, we're doing uh, 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. for that specifically. Um, during the summer, like when the splash pad and... Uh, the volleyball is happening. We uh, the post out reaches from four till midnight, uh, but for now until the foreseeable future, when it gets uh, lighter out sooner again, it's going to be uh, one till nine p.m. It's very valuable what you do, so thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So I have here. So uh, I'm just going to speak to, um, thank you very much for that. Uh, what we can do uh, with the Compassionate Committee for the Homeless in North Bay, we have a Facebook page, so we can put that information on our Facebook page, so I've made note of that. The other thing we do is we have the Good Samaritan Corner, and for folks um, that uh, uh, have committee members who are representative, uh, of the Compassion Committee, then you'll see that that information could be in our Good Samaritan Corner in our church bulletins as well. So there are two avenues that we can do right away yep. uh, for that. Uh, the other thing is because this is recorded on YouTube, on the um, Trinity United Church YouTube channel, so there'll be an opportunity for that as well. Um, but yeah, this is why we have this information session tonight, is because of that, that question. So already, I think that we're, we're moving forward on education, mm -hmm. which is part of what you want to do, too. So that's wonderful. Nancy. Thank you. Yes, I just Nancy always has questions, by the way. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I just had a quick question about, um, about your funding and how you're funded and whether, I mean, I'm assuming it's obvious that you could use donations for things like socks and all of that. But can you just explain a little bit? Um, the umbrella that you come under and, and what we might be able to do as a community to support you with donations. Items. Yeah, so our funding is all through proposals and it's usually uh, like shorter grants, like one, it's usually just one year contracts at a time, um, which is why most of the staff are on one year contracts. Um, most of the outreach is actually through Health Canada funding, which is uh, coming up at the end of March. Again, we hope to get it extended, but it's, you never really know until about a week before. Uh, before it ends, that's just kind of how it works, but it's uh, all of our own, like we have to write our own proposals and get all our own funding. Okay, so are there donations that, that you need, things you need besides socks we, and things? We always <laughs> are glad to take donations. So, <laughs> socks are a big one. Socks, like year round when it comes to socks. And, um, and again, even with socks, they don't have to be fa like those big bags. So even in the winter, I know they're not the warmest, but again, it's more about keeping them dry because they, they just get wet and they're almost like, think of them as throwaways. A lot of these folks will throw them away. So we got to remember that. So 
um, socks in the winter, like gloves. Again, they don't have to be nice, big, thick gloves, even like thinner gloves just to keep their hands a bit warmer, toques. Um, but yeah, we were always accepting donations. I think our address is actually on there too. Okay, so so if someone ever had a donation, they could always just come and drop it off at the office. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thanks you. Okay, so um, if you have any questions for John or Josh, I encourage you to seek them out at the end of the formal portion of the evening. Uh, and then, and even if, say, you don't have a question, but later on it comes to you, then I know that our guest speakers will be here for a few minutes afterwards. And uh, I encourage you to sp please speak to them. And then if, say, you're like me and you have a question at 3 o'clock in the morning and you get up and you write it down, um, and then the next day, don't call them at 3 in the morning, but in the next day, if you want to reach out to them, um, um, John's going to be handing out some business cards, so there'll be some contact information. But for folks who, uh, you know, Google is your best friend, you can always Google uh, True Self and you'll have the information there on your website. So thank you so much for coming tonight. It was wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so our third presenter, um, our final presenter this evening, is uh, Steve Ellis. And Steve um, presented to the Compassionate Committee for the Homeless in North Bay two months ago. Uh, it was a very powerful presentation. And so I asked Steve, I said, would you feel comfortable being a presenter at our information session? And he's like, of course, Leah, I would do that, you know. So um, I, want to, uh, I, I want to invite Steve to come up and join me. And uh, um, he is an expert by experience. But he uh, talked to us about the domino effect as well uh, when he came to speak to our committee. And uh, so uh, I know we only have 10 minutes. Um, I know, but, and we definitely want to have time for questions. So I'm going to sit, and then when I stand, you know you're running out of time. Okay, Steve? Okay. okay. Uh, hi, my name's Steve Ellis. Um, whew, a lot of people over here. <laughs> anyways, yeah, um, uh, anyways, uh, I'm 50, 54 years old. Um, I was born in Toronto into an interracial adoption. I grew up in Sault Ste. Marie. I was adopted by uh, my parents and brothers and sisters were all white. Everyone I went to school with was white. And so I had a lot of racial tendencies at school, got into a lot of fighting, stuff like that. Um, started rebelling against everyone because I just didn't fit in anywhere I went. And uh, that landed me up in a uh, lot of trouble. Um, I'm just sort of briefly going to go through everything quick. And so after that, I ended up, uh, I had a party at my dad's house. Well, they, ki they kicked me out when I was 14. They kicked me out. In Sault Ste. Marie, and I was living on the streets, uh, streets of Sault Ste. Marie, nowhere to go, nothing to do, scared kids, you know, 14. Uh, they went away to my grandparents, so I knew they were gone, so I decided to take this girl I was sort of hanging out with over there. I said, do you want to go hang out for a weekend? She said, sure. We went over there, and she said, well, let's have a party. And I said, okay, yeah, sure. Next thing I know, there's like 25-year-olds and 26-year-olds, and I'm just a little kid, and I'm like, you guys got to get out of my house, you know? And uh, it was Christmas time, they're ripping open all the presents. I was scared. I couldn't do anything. And, uh, yeah, they just destroyed my parents' house. So my dad came home the next day. I was trying to clean up. Uh, he, brought, he came home, brought me to the police station, told the police that he wanted to have me charged. The police said, well, we can't charge him. He's in, your, he's in your custody. He's not even old enough to be out of your house. And he's like, well, I don't want him at home. So they left me in the cell. And then the next day, they let me out. 
And uh, when I was leaving, the police officer stopped me. He goes, don't go near your dad's house. They don't love you anymore. They don't want you around. Don't go near them. So I just said, what? And I said, okay. So then from then on, my life was going just downhill. Um, yeah, and I ended up being homeless there. And I was, uh, it uh, brings back a lot of hard memories on me. And uh, so when the cops said, my, my dad doesn't love me and my parents don't love me, I already felt bad enough that I got the Christmas was ruined and everything. And so uh, I never went home again. I lost contact with my parents for uh, 12 years, mm, decade, good decade anyways, yeah, 12 years. And I ran into my sister in Sudbury. I was homeless in Sudbury. I was just kept running the streets in Sault Ste. Marie, and I left there, went to Sudbury, and I ran into my sister, and my sister was like, Mom and Dad are going to put a missing persons report out on you. I go, it's been 10 years, you know, why now? So anyway, she said, phone them. So I phoned them, and uh, I said, yeah, I'm alive, you know. And uh, I just hung up. I just told them I was alive. And uh, being homeless when I was young like that, it was so scary, you know, like a lot of older people take advantage of you, get to do, doing a lot of stuff that you don't want to do, but you do it to survive, right? And that's uh, doing crime, petty crime, selling drugs, doing drugs. I got into drugs when I was young, 12 years old, 13 years old. I was doing uh, mescaline and smoking weed and acid and all that stuff, and I was just a kid. Um, and then, uh, yeah, being, I remember I was nowhere to go, sleeping underneath bridges and stuff like that, you know, and I just, I just forgot about my parents. I just thought nobody wanted me because, like, I got adopted. Actually, I got adopted twice, and uh, so I just, like, I still suffer from abandonment. Like, I talked to a therapist when, a couple of years ago and goes, you got to talk about abandonment because that's what he says I suffer from. And I'm like, yeah, it makes sense, you know? So that was rough. And um, anyways, I ended up uh, doing a lot of stuff. I ended up, uh, I actually got to go back home. Somehow I made it back home. My mom let me back in, I was 15. And then uh, my dad flew me to Toronto and dropped me off at the Covenant uh, under 21 house was 50 bucks. Told me to have a good life. And I was like, what do you mean have a good life? He's like, just stay here, find a job, you'll do good. And I was like, what do you mean? I want to go home, you know? And then he left. And uh, that turned my life. I started hanging around bad people, but they're the ones that kept me alive, kept giving me money. You know, and they'd be like, do this, or give you money for this, jump, do them. just uh, different things. I'm real nervous right now. I'm just shaking in here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I ended up, I went down a bad road, whatever, and then that brought me down to, I did a lot of uh, juvenile time to adult time. I did 16 years in the pen. Uh, for like robbery with violences and that, and I was just mess, messed up kid, you know, and I just, that's all I knew. It's just how to make money and how to steal and rob and stuff like that. And then uh, I got sick of it. I got just sick of the revolving door syndrome, whatever, so I wanted to get help. I never had help before, never asked for help. And uh, I went back to Sudbury and I ended up going to detox. I went to detox and uh, I stayed there. It was supposed to be seven days. They kept me 21 days. I was so messed up. And then uh, I didn't, like, I was like, well, you know, this is okay. I started getting back into my heritage of smudging and going to smudge groups. 
And uh, and I I had an elder there, and elder was just, he's like, I was talking to him, and I don't know, he brought some, just brought my soul on me or something. I still remember it. I was just standing by the wall with him, and I was just chanting. Like chanting something, I only know it. But it's just like I was like humming, and he's like, "Calm down!" And I'm like, I can't stop going like humming and that. And he's like, "What? Like, calm down!" He's like, "You're doing good. You're doing good." And everyone kept seeing. They can say in their side, they can see the uh, my eyes change. They can see the life come back into my eyes. My eyes are black. Like, if you look at me, you wouldn't even recognize me. And then, like, if you see me today, you'd be like, no, that isn't him. And so anyways, uh, yeah, it was hard. And like in Toronto, Toronto was bad, you know? Nowhere to go, 15 years old, 16 years old at the Evergreen, hanging around outside the eating center, sleeping wherever, you know? It's just a bad, just it's hard, you know, and uh, yeah, being homeless, it's it's not fun at all, and like, anyways, I, I, it's, no, it's not fun, it's hard, and like, I do a lot of outreach now, I'm jumping all over the place, because I'm really nervous, <laughs> but um, uh, it's just, like when you're scared and alone and you don't know what to do and you know wearing the same clothes every day and carrying your same everything you own in a bag and people just look down on you you can't get no money you can't go in and you know you go in a restaurant they're like get out of here we don't want you in here you know and then it's like okay I'll show you you know a nice young girl I'll show you next night I go there and smash all the windows you know or some, just, uh, I was a real bad, like, I was hurting kid. And uh, it was scary, a lot of scary times. I seen a lot of bad things, a lot of bad things. And uh, yeah, so after the penitentiary and all that stuff, I decided to change my life around. And uh, that's when I went to the detox. I went to detox and then uh, detox, uh, is that my five minutes? All right. Oh, I thought it was my five minutes. I was just going to say, um, yeah. Well, I'll just have two minutes. Okay. So, anyways, I went back and so I decided to change my life. So, I was in uh, Sudbury and asked my sister to come down and get me. And everyone in my family told her not to come and get me, but she did, anyways. And she brought me here to North Bay. So I came to North Bay and uh, I started my own outreach program. I didn't know what to do and I seen a lot of homeless people and I knew how they felt. I knew how they were. I knew, I know, I can relate to almost any homeless person anywhere. I've been there, I've done it with and I grew a huge rapport with like 80% of the homeless population in North Bay. and. Uh, and I know where they come from. They're like good people. They just had it rough, you know? And so I started talking to them and then I started volunteering at the AIDS committee. I stayed there for a year. And then I went, uh, I got handpicked to go on a panel for uh, the wrongful deaths of institutions of all the guys that got killed in all the institutions by guards and, uh, and from, uh, medical and just the wrongful deaths in institutions. And I sat on that panel and the panel went in front of the government and it passed. That was a huge thing. I was a great on I sat on that panel. I advocated for everyone in institutions. And then it's like, okay, you know, this is good. And I did a few events here, Indigenous Taco Day at the health center, and then I, I kept talking to Donna, my boss, from when I was at AIDS committee, when they do a map thing, it's virtual between different agencies, and I always used to say hi. So I finally went in and talked to her, and yeah, she said, okay, I'll give you a chance to hire on, and I loved it, you know? And I've been doing any kind of outreach, helping anyone. 
I live right downtown by the uh, TD Bank. I got people banging at my door all the time. Still, I help them. I get clothes, coffee, you know, sometimes it's freezing. Come on in, you know, sit down. They're human. They just want to, they just want someone to trust them, someone to care about them. And I care about them all. I care about every single person. And uh, I don't refuse anybody because I know how it is and, and I relate to all of them. And it, uh, the stigma is so bad, it's just, you know, you're marked before you even get a chance to do anything. You're like, you, you know, how can you go to the mall when you haven't showered in a week, you know, and you've got 20 bags in the shopping cart? They're like, no, you can't come in the mall, right? And stuff like that, and like, it's so sad. And, and like, I give so many coats out, and like, you know, I got an awesome team at uh, True Self. They're all awesome. It's a family. We all get along great. You know, I had some trauma that I saw there. I you know, found a homeless guy that was uh, passed away in the outhouse, you know, and that's how he's staying warm. And that sort of screwed up my head. And, I, you know, and that was my biggest fear is finding him, someone in an encampment that wasn't living, that was dead. And uh, that happened twice to me. And then, so I didn't even go to work, and I didn't realize they didn't go to work. And my team came and checked on me. No one ever checked on me. And they're like, hey, you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. But I didn't realize they didn't go to work. And it affected me big time. And uh, so I went back to work, and it was like, you know, these guys actually care about me. So I was like, you know, and it felt good to be cared about. I got a chance, you know. I got the chance and that's all. And sometimes people just need that one chance. Give them a chance and, you know. And I took that chance, I got that chance and I just keep thriving forward. I'll just keep going and going. And like, I'll, I work all the time. I try to do better, you know. Try to, you know, try to be the best person I can be possibly. Do my smudge groups, like I run the warrior smudge group at True Self with all the guys. And uh, I go over to Susswin, it's another place for guys. Go over there and teach over there, tell them stories, we all talk. And it's like, it's getting better, but it's far from better. It's but it's getting there slowly, but needs a lot, you know? And it's a, I, I just, I don't know, the homelessness is just, it's a scary thing, and especially winter time right now, it's the most scariest part for me walking around, finding people. Like I have a couple of people I haven't seen in a couple of weeks, and that's really bothering me. And then I ran into one, two days ago, so I was like right on. And so, it's, you know, once you start to know these people and understand what's, what they're going through, where, where they're at, they're not bad at all. And like, I'll even say, like my sister used to be afraid of homeless people and stuff like that. After she's been in my house and seen everyone coming to my house, now she's like, oh, hi, how's it going, you know? talking away to them, and she changed her whole, her whole view on it, right? It's a, just got to give them a chance, that's it. I'm so, I'm so thankful that God, creator, that I got my chance, and if I can pass on any message to anyone else that needs it, I would. Well, yeah. Steve, you're doing that tonight, Me so thank too. you so much. And I want to open it up to questions because sure. we're sort of running out of time. So does anybody have any questions for Steve? And if so, please come to the mic. Your presentation was that good that you answered all the questions? <laughs> I was all over the so, place. I was so nervous. I have a question that. for you, Steve. Okay. I have a question for you. So when you came to speak to us a couple of months ago, you brought a friend with you. Oh, okay. And yeah. you said that your friend was the example of the domino this, effect. This, you know, exactly. And that's what I love that so much. Like, I worked with, uh, I went to school with him 
for, like, I think I went to school for three days, <laughs> but I knew him in Sault Ste. Marie, and I, and I knew him, we were friends, and I came to North Bay, and I found out he was here, and I found out he was homeless, so I actually got people to find him, and I did a smudging ceremony for him, and uh, he just stuck to me, and uh, I couldn't believe he was homeless seven years here. And I was like, you've been seven years homeless. Like, what, what are you doing? He's like, and then he told me a story and I got it, right? Like he had some bad things happen and he just couldn't get out of it. So, and I worked with him. It took me two years of pounding into his head. Or, you know, it's, it's like, come on, you can do it, you can do it. Now, you know, it's a domino effect. He followed me. Now he's in Susswin, he has two jobs, he's clean, he's sober, he's gone to Nova Scotia for the cert, that uh, thing you guys went to, and uh, he's doing amazing. And like, it, and like every time I see him, it's just like big hugs, smiles, you know, he's got a bunch of weight on him, little pudgy guy now, and I just <laughs> laugh, <laughs> you know, and it's a domino effect. I rubbed off on him, now he's rubbing off on this other guy that's following him, and it's a domino effect that just, what you need to just give them the chance, you know, and just help them, and it's a, like, I, I, not, detox helped me, but I just, I helped him, and now he's helping someone, and now that other guy's helping another guy, so it's like, it's rolling, you know, and it's a good, positive, it's the best thing, yeah, he's my main success story. He's awesome. I'd say his name, but I don't want to say his name. Well, and thanks so much, Steve, for sharing yeah. your story. I know it's hard to talk about it, but you yeah. have a lot of courage. Yeah. And, um, I, and you know, you're an example of how one person can make a difference. And I see there's about 50 people here in this church, and each one of you can make a difference by being that kind, compassionate person and that caring person. So Steve, thank you so much. They just <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And I know after the formal portion, if you want to come speak to Steve, Steve would love to talk to you some more about his experiences. Um, and if you are part of an organization and you want Steve or any one of our guest speakers to come and speak, by all means, um, you can invite them. Uh, they have been absolutely wonderful this evening. So a round of applause for our guest speakers again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so I want to conclude tonight uh, by... Um, uh, promoting something that we're doing on Saturday. So the Compassionate Committee for the Homeless in North Bay will be holding, I think this is our third winter boot campaign. So uh, just as was asked uh, tonight, uh, we are collecting hats, mitts, gloves, socks, um, you know, to, to help the homeless as well. Uh, if you want to sponsor a pair of brand new winter boots, $50 and we will do the shopping for you. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll connect with the frontline organizations because they know the sizes that are required. Because the homeless are on their feet quite a bit and we want to make sure the boots fit well because there's nothing worse than um, having blisters on your feet and especially when you're on your feet for quite a bit of time. So um, if you want any more information, check us out on Facebook. We also have flyers um, at the back on the uh, winter boot campaign and the information. But we are having it on Saturday from 10 till 2 at the Pro Cathedral of the Assumption Garages. And that's where you can drop off any of your donations. We also have e-transfer. So we have the email address on our donation box at the back. Sue, if you can just kind of wave, Sue can help you with that. She's at the back there, so she can certainly help you with that. Um, and other than that, I just wanted to say once again, thank you so much to Trinity for hosting the, uh, the evening and working with us. It has been amazing and, and I am so inspired by everybody and everything that I've heard. And I've taken a lot of notes. So uh, thank you once again. Have a good evening.